Hey there, nerds. It's me, Dr. Jordan Breeding, which, like, yes, sort of sounds like the raw materials for a solid B-plus sex joke, but nobody has ever come up with a genuinely funny riff on it, so why even try? Uh, someone somewhere is maybe watching this friggin' episode of Your Brain on Crack, the show made in such an isolated way that I'm not 100% sure I haven't dreamt the whole thing, and the only show on Crack where, uh, you know what? Actually, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is a dream, because I'm not even wearing pants! Ah! Whatever, let's diagnose something. As people are always yelling at me in the comments, movies are supposed to be fun. They're supposedly better if you just sit back and enjoy the pretty explosions rather than take time to stop and smell the civilian corpses. But sometimes it feels like the protagonist really should stop and, I don't know, say a few prayers or something because there is a depressingly massive amount of ignored corpses, guys, and it is, it is bumming me out. Aquaman remains one of the more watchable DCEU outings, largely because of its willingness to embrace absurdity. It boasts a large-scale battle rivaling Lord of the Rings Helm's Deep, except with, with like a ton of crabs. Also, at one point, a god octopus plays the god drums because god art, baby. It even features a villain whose head is clearly inspired by the indie dramedy Frank, which makes it yet another cultivated choice by a filmmaker well known for his subtlety. <laughs> This madness is in service of making Aquaman fun and cool because, you know, ostensibly he's just a dude who mostly swims fast and talks to fish. And all that's well and good for most of the film, but there's one brief moment during the aforementioned massive battle where that commitment to insanity and explosiveness results in what is in retrospect a pretty horrifying sequence of events. This happened because you me. In an effort to turn the tide <laughs> of battle, Aquaman uses his ability to control fish to summon them in and just throw their soft squishy bodies into the enemy's ships in a kamikaze suicidal effort. I mean, it's like, imagine Luke Skywalker force blasting a bunch of Ewoks into an ats -T. Now, obviously, I'm an expert on both marine anatomy and aquatic vehicular combat, so believe me when I say that the only way a dolphin blows up a war submarine is if it swims into the engine and its mangled body causes catastrophic systems failure. Oh, man. Even for the larger animals, like whales that appear to blast through ships relatively unharmed, the sheer amount of sea creatures on screen ensures that every single time a laser or a harpoon is fired, hunks of whale meat are getting blown off alongside a couple hundred smaller incinerated Nemos. Aquaman's whole thing is supposedly caring about the ocean, sometimes at the expense of land dwellers, but he sure seems willing to bend the rules whenever he's in a tight spot. Ecological impact, be damned. Damn, we're in a tight spot. In Sonic the movie, we learn that because of his ability to run like so fast, he will forever spend his days hunted by those who wish to harness his power to, I don't know, more quickly deliver Amazon packages. Gotta go. But so Sonic's guardian, who I think is the Tootsie Pop owl, gives Sonic a bag of rings that allow him to travel to any planet in the universe and stay one step ahead of Bezos minions. Did you know that? Fun fact, the owl Longclaw was actually created for the movie, which means she's the only Sonic character not to appear in any erotic fan art. Alexa, turn on the sprinklers. Sonic initially chooses to hide on Earth, and that works for a while until one day when Sonic gets lonely and then runs really fast to the point that he attracts the attention of the US government and Jim Carrey because, I don't know, it's a video game movie, shut up. Get into the and left. Sonic, realizing he's been made, prepares to jump to another planet, but because this planet is made out of mushrooms, Sonic decides not to do that, and, and he decides to stay. And also, I guess there are no other non-mushroom planets worth escaping to in the entire universe, but so whatever. He remains on Earth and has a series of relatively tame, bloodless adventures while chased by Dr. Robotnik. That is, until he and his human friend arrive in San Francisco. By this point, Dr. Robotnik has synthesized one of Sonic's quills to be able to move just as quickly as, I don't know, say an intergalactic hedgehog. <laughs> What results is a chase scene through the streets of San Francisco with Robotnik blowing up everything in sight, including a, a bus full of civilians. For most of this scene, if you squint hard enough, you could pretend that the buildings obliterated by Robotnik are closed or out of business thanks to coronavirus, which I guess isn't that fun to think about, but, but this bus is in the middle of an intersection. I mean, sure, it looks like it stopped because Sonic and Robotnik are moving so quickly, 
but it's not. It's operating as normal. It's also in the middle of the day, so you have to assume the bus was just full of passengers who are now charred meat just festering in the middle of the road. At least the movie Speed had the courtesy to make sure we didn't actually think they killed a baby. There was no baby, it was full of cats. But the movie just blows past the implications of the scene because, wow, look, at Sonic's uh, cool slide. But Jesus, that's like 60 people dead because Sonic chose to dick around in San Francisco instead of going to the Mushroom Planet. Or again, anywhere else in the galaxy, like Oakland. I said we ain't do shit, you can't fucking arrest us. Oh yeah? Ooh, maybe not Oakland. <laughs> These deaths are at least partially on his tiny gloved hands. My guess is the scene just sort of slipped through when all of the production efforts were focused on Sonic's freaky teeth. <laughs> Pretty early on in Spider-Man 3, like before the dancing, but after Harry is diagnosed with deadly plot required selective amnesia, a crane goes ape and begins wrecking an office building. That alone would probably be enough to justify Peter Parker's involvement, but he's doubly interested because one of the people about to be obliterated by construction machinery is the super hot Gwen Stacy. Okay, Gwen, I've got a secret. It's my c And it doesn't hurt that he and Mary Jane have had some rough times recently, though not as, not as rough as the time he splooged Mary Jane to death with his radioactive spider juice. <laughs> But so anyway, Spider-Man does what spiders do and catches Gwen before she becomes a strawberry blonde splat on the sidewalk. Parker then spends a few minutes shooting the shit with reporter Topher Grace before swinging away to his next, hopefully splooge-free adventure. Yeah, well, maybe next time. And that's great and all, but it's not like Gwen worked in an office building alone. What about everybody else that isn't so conventionally attractive or so directly related to Ron Howard? And more importantly, did anybody actually stop the rogue crane? This proved a more difficult dramatic gesture than he'd anticipated. Seriously, you can still hear screaming in the background and see emergency responders booking it all over the place while shit like debris and paper continue to fall from the sky, but no, it's fine. The named character survived and we got a halfway decent action scene. Similar to poet laureate Frederick Durst, Spider-Man only does it for the nookie. Ready Player One imagines a world where no original pop culture has been created in decades, and the only thing anybody cares about is plugging into an online simulator to shoot each other and revel in cool nostalgia shit from the past. So it's, it's like, it's like right now. Poppy cock. But one day, twist! The creator of the simulator world called the Oasis dies and sets up an elaborate game for his would-be successor. Whoever finds a bunch of clues and Easter eggs throughout the system will be deemed worthy of the virtual throne. And while there are many professional nerds hunting down the clues, they are no match for our hero Wade Watts and his unhealthy knowledge of classic video games and 80s movies and also his ownership of the world's largest van. Now I know what you're thinking. This sounds like perfect job for you, Jordan. You win game in five minutes, tops. <laughs> and I, I appreciate that, Vladimir, it's very kind. Except pop culture knowledge isn't really what's required to win and take over the Oasis. See, Watts is actually an expert in the Oasis creator, Halliday. Oh, that's just me. Wade hasn't just seen The Shining, he knows that it's Halliday's 11th favorite horror film. In between Stephen King film binge sessions, this every dweeb has apparently spent countless hours pouring through Halliday's personal memories and learning weird intimate shit like Halliday's favorite food, which is more than a bit different than just memorizing a few killer Robocop lines. All in all, Wade is less the coolest raddest cinephile on the land and more the world's creepiest and most obsessive stalker. You have a birthmark. Even weirder and sadder, this is clearly what Halliday himself wanted. Halliday wanted his successor to know him, not just to catch all of his dope ass references to Nightmare on Elm Street and Starcraft and the Simon Rhythm game, which such a cool reference, Halliday. Halliday is little more than a sad dead man who ultimately hands his prized possession over to another sad alive man who cares way too much about this guy he'll never meet. The most egregious example of all this is the clue that ultimately breaks the game wide open. Communism was just a red herring. While watching Halliday's memories, a thankfully fully clothed and unlubricated Watts suddenly realizes Halliday was always in love with his best friend's wife, which is a pretty twisted and sad detail to hide in your video game, man. Almost as sad as being the loser that figured it out by watching a man's video journal 17,000 times. That is, that is not funny. <laughs> is it weird to talk about a romantic comedy classic after a bunch of CGI explosion orgies? Maybe.
but also this is my fever dream, and no dream of mine is complete without at least one mention of Tom No Pants Cruise. Whatever. Jerry Maguire tells the story of a super rich sports agent who decides his super rich clients deserve more one-on-one -on -one attention, you know, because otherwise we'd have a bunch of sad millionaires moping around. 11.2 million dollars you're gonna get to play in Arizona where it all started. The client that inspires Jerry's change of heart and uh, to write the manifesto that begins his hero's journey is the oft-concussed hockey player at the beginning. Jerry visits this dude in the hospital where he's recovering from his fourth concussion. The hockey player pretty much immediately tells Jerry he needs to get back out there on the ice as soon as possible so he can activate a bonus in his contract. Jerry absolutely agrees because yeah, more money is better than less money. I mean, you can always buy a new brain. The human head weighs eight pounds. But as Jerry's leaving, the player's kid runs out and tells Jerry that his dad needs to stop playing for his health. But Jerry brushes it off and tells the kid, come on, it'd take a tank to stop your dad. It would take all five Super Trooper VR warriors, am I right? Did I mention this movie was in the 90s? Everybody has to do chores, Peter. The, the kid looks at Jerry and offers him a crisp, well, you. Yes, you Jerry, struck in the heart, writes his manifesto that night and as a result is fired the next day, losing all of his non-Cuba Gooding Jr. clients. That clearly includes the NHL player who is presumably still stuck with the same sports agency that Jerry was a part of pre-Epiphany. But that also means that Wayne Retzky is gonna keep playing, keep getting himself hurt, and likely acquire even more significant brain injury and damage. And this is my boy. And this is my boy. But uh, that's it. We never hear from that dude again. And as if to further drive his hopeless in his home, Cuba Gooding Jr. himself gets a concussion scare at the end of the movie, getting knocked out freaking cold after a touchdown catch. But again, while that would immediately get you placed in the modern NFL's concussion protocol, mid-90s Cuba hops up and dances around like a damn lunatic because he just boosted his contract value alongside his likelihood of premature CTE death. Just, just let me enjoy this for a minute. So yeah, best not to think about that hockey player with an even more significant injury history, way less pay, a less intentional sports agent, and almost no chance of avoiding significant brain damage. You had me at holy hell, my brain is pretty much Tom Cruise. I love black people! Yeah, well, I don't know. There's nothing written here. It's just like a sexy owl or something. I don't know, leave me alone, okay? Oh, it's not even real! Uh, hold on, I'm trying to think of what would be erotic fan art. Like a penis or like maybe just boobs? Just give it boobs. Perfect. Looks so much like a bat. I know, but. I should have put the wings in. No, it's perfect. It's great.